Juicy conversation. All right, we did it. Hey, Kate. Hey, Kamal. Hi. Hello. Hey, 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 hey. Well, um, folks are piling in the room. Um, just want to say hi to everybody. My name's Erin, and I'm the National Director at Showing Up for Racial Justice. Um, we are the largest organization to explicitly organize white people for racial justice in U.S. history. Um, Kate, I've heard you, but you're in charge of uh, a lot of white people's whiteness. <laughs> and Serge is also in that business. <laughs> we are in the business of a lot of white, white people's whiteness. Um, we have over 175 chapters across the country. We've got folks um, that are showing up in the work everywhere from New York City to rural Tennessee and everywhere in between. Um, and I'm so glad to be here with you, Kate and Kamal, today to talk about your amazing new book, Do the Work. Um, really, really happy um, to be in conversation with you all today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us and thanks for all your work. Yeah, yeah. Glad to be in this. Well, can I brag on you both for a second here? Folks might already know who you are, but I want to give a little context. Um, you probably all know W. Kamal Bell from television. He's a TV host, a writer, a stand-up comic, and a cultural critic. Um, and Kate Schatz is an author, historian, and the author of the best-selling book, uh, many best-selling books, including Rad Women in American History and Rad Women A to Z. And both Kate and Kamal are parents, and they're both best-selling authors of Do the Work. Um, so I'm so glad that y'all are here today. Thank, Thank you so for having much. us. Yeah. Can we dive right in? We got a good crew yeah. watching here. All right, all right. So your book's amazing, and it helps white people do, not just white folks, but some, you know, some white folks, um, do a lot of things. It helps folks reflect on privilege, get more grounded in the history of black leaders that have been in this work, and even some white anti-racist leaders that have been in this work um, over, over many, many decades. There's checklists. There's like everything in here. And I'm curious if y'all could just share a little bit about like, why did you think this book was needed and what led you to to, to create it in the first place? Yeah. Okay. okay, I'll take this one. <laughs> um, so Kamal and I have been friends and kind of co-conspirators and collaborators for a number of years. We both live in the East Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area. So shout out any Bay Area people that are watching. Uh, and uh, this book comes, so this book is an, anti-racist activity book for grown-ups is how we describe it. Um, the tagline that we use, they wouldn't let us put it on the book, but the way we describe it is the book is funny, but not fucking around. Uh, All right. <laughs> we basically uh, use illustrations and games and activities and comics and crossword puzzles uh, to get at some really critical, important and difficult content, uh, which is uh, the realities of white supremacy, uh, specifically in America, uh, our history, how we got here, and what we can all be doing to dismantle it. Um, we did it as an activity book for a number of reasons. Um, you know, one is that uh, not everybody wants to pick up a 500 page scholarly, um, brilliant, heavily researched, dense book about, um, about American mm -hmm. history is just kind of the reality. People don't have attention spans. People feel intimidated. That's just not everybody's jam. So we wanted to create something. Um, those books are necessary and have fueled and informed our work. So we wanted to create something that could be like a compliment to the books that are already out there. Um, we know people have short attention spans. <laughs> we know people are often resistant or reluctant or unsure about how to get into this work. So we wanted to use humor um, and games and a kind of playful approach uh, to get at some, again, some really serious, some serious stuff. I love it. Funny, but not fucking around. I'm so here for that. <laughs> um, well, so one question that you all tackle in the book is you name that, so, you know, and we see this at Surge all of the time that for so, for so many white folks coming into consciousness about race, a lot of guilt and shame can come up, right? And, um, and at Surge, we think it's absolutely essential that we move through that and into action and into doing the work. And, you know, it's, it is normal for us to make mistakes in this work, right? And so I'm wondering if one or both of you might speak to a time that you made a mistake and how you were able to recover and stay in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, as we say, like, I think one of the things that Kate put to me before we even wrote the book was that a lot of, in 2020, when a lot of white folks and a lot of American general were coming to a new understanding of racism in this country, uh, there was a sense of like, like, what happens if I fuck up? What happens if I mess up? And we wanted to go, and one thing that Kate put perfectly that's in the book is like, no, 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 it's not if, it's when. When you fuck up. <laughs> and, so, and so really understanding, having people practice the idea of like how to recover from 
from fucking up and messing up. And I, you know, I always quote the prophet Daniel Tiger from PBS uh, saying, I'm sorry is the first step, then how can I help? And so it's about the idea that like, that, and I've, and you know, both of us have messed up many times, somewhat, not famously, but infamously, I would say, you know, I was on ABC, this is in the book, I was on local ABC television in San Francisco, zooming in from my house during the pandemic, post George Floyd, and I was brought on, brought on to talk about racism. And in the, on the show, the Asian American reporter, Kristen Z, I was like, hey, Kristen, we've met before. I was on the show with you years ago. And she's like, that's not me. That's Janelle Wong. That's not me. And I was like, ah, and I'm the racism expert. <laughs> so the idea being that, like, and I got, I got my hair stood up on my, on my arms and I got all weird. And she was like, no, that happens all the time. I was like, I know that's true, but I have to be here and I have to own up the fact that I made that mistake and, and say I'm sorry and, and do a better job of not doing things like that. And so, and that's me as somebody who's brought on TV to be the racism expert. So if the racism expert, and it's in heavy quotes because I'm not Cornel West despite the gray in my hair, or uh, <laughs> Dr. E from X Kennedy despite the fact that I used to have long dreads, dreads uh, th that it is messing up is just a part of this work. Yes, totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wonder, so, so I think sometimes, so that's, that's the attitude we want people to have. And I think in reality, you know, a lot of people do get stuck or stuck in the like, I don't want to make the mess up. And I wonder, Kate or Kamal, if one of you could speak to like, why it's actually not helpful for white folks to stay on the sidelines and not do the work or just try to shrink and stay silent. Like what, what's the cost of that? Or like, wh why is that not the move? Oh, I mean, the cost is... I mean, the, the cost is people's lives. You know, that's, that's the reality, you know, um, like the people, this is, <laughs> this is deadly. Ser Again, you know, we use humor in our particular book to, to talk about something that is deadly serious. People are dying, um, you know, at the hands of, of white supremacist domestic terrorists, at the hands of cops, um, many of which are actual white supremacist domestic terrorists. <laughs> um, people, you know, people are, are losing their lives. They're losing families this is serious stuff. So the cost of saying silent, of, um, of, of failing to get over your own self and your own anxieties about being wrong um, is other people's lives. So I think it's a pretty significant cost. And, you know, I think that, um, I, I think a lot about the idea of risk, right? Like when we want to make change, and if we, if you want to commit to anti-racist work, you have to there has to be some risk involved. And risk risk looks like a lot of different things for different people, right? Depending on who you are, where you live, what your community is. So risk isn't always about risking your physical safety, right? It could be about maybe the risk is uh, speaking up at work or, um, you know, taking a risk in your friend group um, or, or risking a hard conversation with family. And I think that I want to acknowledge that those risks are really hard, right? That's like, your your risk is your risk and that's difficult work um but when you compare it to the lived experience of black and brown and indigenous people in this country on a daily basis like you know i think uh your the risk you know your risk is worth it Amen. yeah and i would say this that like you know the history of this country has been there have been many examples of white people who understood their white privilege could be used to help mm -hmm. end and dismantle racism uh, I think specifically I'm thinking about, we did an episode of United Shades about white liberals who are, who are actively anti-racist. And one of the groups we, cover, we covered in Tacoma, Washington was the Puget Sound Gun Club, who are in the mold of John Brown. So these are white liberals who are also gun owners and Second Amendment advocates. And specifically what they do is when Black Lives Matter shows up, and it's, Black Lives Matter tends to be a, a mostly black protest a lot of times, they as white gun owners stand between Black Lives Matter and the cops because they know that their white skin will protect them from the, from the cops in ways that it will not protect the unarmed black people behind them. So it really is about figuring out how can you interrupt, how can you stand between, I mean, Kate writes in the book about cop watching. If, if Kate sees a, she talks about that when, if she sees a black man being pulled over by the cops on the street, she might stop her car, she might pull out her cell phone, she might mm -hmm. ask if he's okay, in a way that even if I do that, I'm putting myself more in harm's way than Kate is doing that. So That's white people really have to interrupt racism and be, and be between it and not interrupt the person. If the black person's talking, it looks like they have it. Don't interrupt them, interrupt the racism. That's right, that's right. That's such an important point. At Surge, we talk so much about how there have always been white folks throughout history who have chosen the right side. There's always been too few of us and we've always done it way imperfectly, but we have always been there. And I, in the book, you all talk about some of those folks. I just pulled, as you said this, I just pulled up this picture of Anne Braden, who is actually named in the book 
and who met, yeah do you have the picture of her right there oh so i love the image of her in the book and there's a there's a snapshot and you know Anne mentored some of the founders of surge Anne was another white woman from kentucky who um put her body on the line and did a lot to bring more white folks into the tins of freedom struggle so i think that's another powerful learning from the book I'm glad, and I, I happen to have that page um, open when you mentioned that. Um, you uh -huh. know, and this is, we, we include this section in the book and we talk about kind of like allyship and what that really looks like, you know, um, and, and do share some models. And in my work, um, both with this book and my other books about American history that are aimed at younger readers, it's really important for me to be sharing those stories of, of white um, radicals, white abolitionists, white freedom fighters who did do the right thing in a different time, right? Um, not as an effort to center more, um, you know, white people or to create a kind of like heroic narrative, um, but to push back against the idea that that was just how it was done then, right? Or the idea that um, there wasn't anybody doing this stuff. You know, intersectionality and solidarity are not new concepts. We're, we're not just coming up with these things now. This has been part of these struggles forever, but we just don't learn them. Um, and I think for white people to learn that there is a lineage and a history of people who've looked like us, who've had privilege like we have, and who've made the conscious decision to risk, in many cases, their lives, um, their businesses, their reputations, um, in, in service of this work. Um, I think it's empowering and it gives us a history to connect to um, that, again, we don't get taught about. Totally. And it's intentional, right? They intentionally hide that from us because it would be something to move towards, right? So I think that's a really, really important point. Um, I want to invite folks to start throwing some questions in the chat. We're going to have time in a few minutes. So go ahead and start throwing your questions in, but I'm going to ask a few more first. Um, I want to stay on this history tip. There's a in the beginning, you all talk a lot. It's this beautiful timeline. I've been studying. See my sticky notes? I've been studying hard. There, you all talk a lot about the, you, I think it's called legislating, legislating race. And you all talk about where, you know, where this concept came from. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about that history, um, because I think it's so, it's so core to how we understand our work at Surge. Um, wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Mm -hmm. um. Uh, yeah, so that is in the beginning of the book, the first chapter, we're talking about kind of what is race and how was race constructed. So um, we have this section and it's a very brief, we kind of create like a little fairy tale story with a timeline about the construction of race and whiteness in colonial America. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, long story short, you know, what we look at here is how um, how how race and class were used to um, basically break up a potential working class uprising in the early colonial days when uh, poor white uh, indentured servants um, and black enslaved people were actually coming together to resist the land owning uh, white people in power um, and how whiteness was really used as a wedge to divide and conquer uh, and to create this class of poor white people who were in a hierarchy better than the black people but still uh, beneath the, the white people in power. Um, and that was really done through law. Um, and so what you see when you study the history of, 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 of enslavement and chattel slavery in this country, you see that it was not initially um, a permanent condition and it was not inherited, right? It was indentured servitude. It was brutal. Everything about it was horrific, but it was not initially uh, a, a permanent condition that you were born into and couldn't get out of. Um, and that was all done through laws, through the black codes, through laws, um, from 1660 through the early 1700s, when the when the Virginia kind of black codes codified, um, you know, the most barbaric system um, that at the same time enabled white indentured servants to, uh, you know, kind of rise up um, in the in the hierarchy. So more stuff that we don't learn. <laughs> I'm so impressed you just did that in like two minutes. That was really impressive. That's 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 one of Kate's superpowers. Kate has several superpowers, and that's one of them. Oh my God, it's unbelievable. I mean, I think this is so important, Kate, and I so appreciate that this is in the book and it, it's, it's part of the beginning of the story because I think at Surge, you know, we, we talk about the privileges that white folks have, but we also understand racism as a thing that also gets in the way of us as white people having the things that we need as well, right? And so the story of divide and conquer, I think is really, really important for white folks who are engaged in racial justice work. And, you know, at Surge, we think that white folks actually have everything to gain from joining multiracial movements for justice, to fighting white supremacy, and to building solidarity and following the leader. You know, it's, it's the vision set by black and brown folks that's actually going to help our lives too. This isn't just about helping people of color. Um, this is about, you know, a vision for liberation that gets us all free. 
Um, and I'm wondering, Kate, if you might share a little bit about kind of your stake as a white woman in this work and, and what keeps you in. Well, I mean, again, like I said earlier, I think everything's at stake. Um, I'm you know, I believe that my freedom is entwined with everybody else's freedom and my liberation doesn't come until everybody's liberation. Um, so that's, I mean, I could, I could go on and on, but like, that's, that's what I believe. <laughs> totally. I mean, it's no different. It's no different than climate change. Like, you can't just change the climate around your house. You have to change. <laughs> we have to be involved in changing the entire climate. And I think it's the same thing with, I think a lot of times white people think they're going to be anti-racist as a way to help the, uh, mm -hmm help the uh the black people or help the latino people and instead sort of like no no if you create an anti racist society you're also helping yourself you should be oh, selfish yeah. in that way about it totally because the reality is you know white communities are in the way of winning just about everything we all care about on every issue whether it's climate change reproductive rights it's white communities you know that get in the way over and over again That's such an important point um i'm wondering if we if, if we can turn to this gorgeous monthly planner which is another beautiful element of the book and I'm curious if y'all can lift up some of the things, some of the action items, like how, how have you seen people use this tool and what are some of the action items that you're encouraging people to, to move into and to, to plan ahead for? I like, well, I mean, so there's a, I guess Kate says that, Kate always tells the story. Tell the, tell the, tell the, uh, the, the sleeping story, the story, the baby, I feel like that's the way. Oh, okay. We have these like anecdotes that we always share. So I, when we started writing this book, I kept referencing when my first child was born, she's walking through the house right now. She's much bigger now. But uh, I remember getting those like infant sleep books, the like baby sleep books that were about how to make your kids sleep. And they would be like 400 pages long. <laughs> and I was always flipping through them like, just where's the part that tells me how to get my baby to sleep? Like, I want, just tell me what to do. Like, I don't even want to read all the research. Like, I'm too exhausted. Just tell me what to do. So we joke that in this book, I mean, we want people to read everything and to, to read these histories and read our conversation throughout the book. But also, if you want to just know what to do, we do have a big list of actions that you can take. And it folds out and it's beautifully illustrated. And it's just a huge list of ideas that we crowdsource from people in our community. Um, and like you said, Aaron, we also include, uh, you know, for a lot of people, one of the barriers to entry for getting more involved is that we're busy, right? Everybody's busy. I'm really busy. I don't have a lot of time. Um, but like anything else that's important to you, you know, you've got to work it in your schedule. So we do, we make a kind of planner. We suggest, you know, having a Google calendar reminder for taking 20 minutes out of your day to just like sit and think about what you can be doing, <laughs> taking action, right? Just putting it on the calendar, joining Surge, showing up to, to you know, things like this. Um, you know, we want people to just, to, to make it part of their daily practice. Incredible. And I would be remiss to not tell people that we're having a phone bank this Saturday at Surge. Uh, we're calling into white Georgia to try to elect a secretary of state that is not going to completely uh, undermine the election results. So you want to take responsibility for organizing some white folks in rural Georgia. Uh, if you go to the surge.org, you can sign up and we'll get, you can put that right in your planner in the book. Yes. Love it. Um, Kate and Kamau, what are, if, if people did one thing after reading this book, what would it be? You've given so many options. Is there one thing you're really hoping people will take away from the book? I mean, I think this is a longer thing than a one thing, but I really think having a fundamental understanding that being an anti-racist is a regular activity. It's no different than working out. Now, we all have different levels of working out. I work out the same way The Rock works out several times a day. I travel with the gym. You can tell from my physique that I've showed on TV before. And some people working out means walking around the block once a day. But I would say this. We all know when we're bullshitting ourselves about working out. And we, all know we, and we all know that if you don't work out regularly, you're not going to get the benefits of working out. So for me, the thing, the fundamental understanding that being an anti-racist is it has to be a regular part of your life. It's not something you do. It's not something you do once a year. It's not something you do for a month in February. It's not something you do through buying Juneteenth flavored ice cream at Walmart. It's got to be a regular part of your activity. And on top of that, just like working out, you have to raise the stakes of what you're doing regularly because the work you're doing before is not going to be as beneficial a year from now. You have to sort of, and so you think about like the actual anti-racist activists out here, they are doing work seven days a week on some level, seven days a week. We can't all get there, start there, but if you can say once a week, I'm going to do it. And then, and then after a month, 
three times a week and really build up the same way you would build up working out. Same way a lot of y'all were doing those Pelotons, but you want to keep doing it, unlike the Peloton. <laughs> Um, and I would add, if there's one thing that I want, you know, people to do and to take away, I mean, uh, I want people to come away feeling curious mm -hmm. and wanting to learn more. Um, and then buy another copy of the book and, you know, give it to your friends, give it to your coworkers. <laughs> totally. <laughs> give it to it the person who hasn't read it yet. It definitely works. I think it really works best if you're doing it with somebody because there are partner activities. There's ways you can go. Here's what I got for the answers. What did you get for the answers? There's quizzes. There's a... Uh, there's there's uh, biographies that you write of yourself, and it'd be good to compare to somebody else who may you know, go, oh, when did you start talking about racism in your life? Uh, and they may say, in this conversation right now. So I think really, it's it, uh, we really think of it as a partner activity. Yeah, I think that's so, I mean, for those of us who are white, some of us have never said the thing, the prompts that you have in the book, some of us have never said this stuff out loud. And so actually to do this in partnership and relationship feels really important. And yeah, the only way we're gonna, you know, push that comfort zone over time as you're talking about Kamal. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I want to see, it seems like there might be some questions from folks who have, have um, joined us. So I want to know, um, want to encourage folks to continue to keep adding questions in the chat, but we have a couple. Um, Kate and Kamau, um, folks are asking if you already have plans for your next book. I would imagine you're exhausted from this first one, but, <laughs> um, or are there, other, are there other resources that you want to point folks to? Though I have to say, I think, I think this book is a pretty good starting point, but who else might you point folks to? And are you already planning edition number two? Yeah, we have good news. Well, we're supposed to be working on it right now, but we haven't, we're not. <laughs> but yeah, we are doing another, we are doing another book and um, it's a, basically a, a young person's version of this book. Um, and to be clear, this book, uh, we use a lot of swear words throughout because we were really mad when we wrote it <laughs> and it felt necessary. Um, but no, I, that said though, I mean, I have a lot of friends, uh, my young children have read it. Um, I'm, if you're cool with your kids seeing the F word occasionally, like this book works for all ages. Um, but we are doing a book that is more focused on on young people and families. And actually, the, one of the things that will be most different about that book um, is uh, this book is meant to be, it's a workbook, there's stickers, there's things you tear out at the end. Um, you're supposed there's coloring pages we want you to write in it. That means that um, it's an awesome book, but it means it can't be in libraries. And for the young people's version, it's really important to us that it be in public libraries and school libraries. That is, that's, accessibility and it's really important especially in this era of these book bans and all of this nonsense so um we are going to do a version that uh is still interactive and encourages activities but doesn't um doesn't require the user to be writing in it so that it can be on those library shelves for young people all over the country amazing um a couple of folks are asking where they can buy it which is very concrete but feels very important where can folks find the book if they want to buy it right now where you buy books, uh, which is hopefully an independent um, bookseller. Um, so if you'd like to buy it online, we definitely recommend that you use bookshop.org, um, which is a great way. They have fast shipping and it's like, easy to use. And when you buy your books there, it does support independent booksellers. Um, if your best option is the rainforest website owned by the, <laughs> the, rain, um, the rainforest people <laughs> you can get it there but i shall not say the name but uh uh hopefully go to your local bookstore um but you know what the sad thing is there's not a lot of local bookstores in a lot of communities so um if buying it online is the best bet bookshop.org otherwise the other website and i and right now part of the reason i'm looking down is because i'm actually signing this giant pile of books while we're on the live. And look at that guy, it's, it's a local bookstore owner, Jason Yay. Smith, and also my best friend since <laughs> high school. Oh, so you can buy it from the book table, which is Jason's bookstore. Uh, and I see in the chat, a couple people are recommending some black owned um, bookstores. Someone's recommending Third Eye in Portland. There's loyalty books in DC. We just did an event with Kindred Stories in Houston. Um, there's Mahogany Books, there's Marcus Books. Um, all you have to do is Google black owned bookstores and you will find a lot of information. It's amazing, it's all there, right at your fingertips on the internet. And I just, I can't remember the name, but they just, oh, there's a, a pretty new black owned bookstore in the Bronx, which is apparently the only bookstore in the Bronx, or maybe the only black owned bookstore in the Bronx. Uh, so check that out too, if you're in the, in the, in the New York area. 
Okay, amazing, amazing. Ooh, or, or also there's Red Planet Books in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's the only native owned comic book store in the entire country. I wanna shout them out. They do incredible work. Amazing, amazing. Um, you guys have time for a few more questions coming in through the chat? Sure. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, can you all talk? So there's been a couple questions that have come through about um, about how what to do if law enforcement is, is acting in a racist way. And I'm curious, like what, what is in the book that might help, might help folks with that? Um, there's not one answer to that. That could mean a million things, but I'm just curious what you all might point to or how the book might be a resource in supporting yeah. people thinking about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. one thing that we talked about that I mentioned earlier is the idea of cop watching, that if you see somebody who's who, uh, specifically a person of color, but really anybody who's in a, interaction with the cops, we, we know how it is with people of color and black folks and indigenous folks, just stop and your presence there will be, you can be there as a witness. We've seen videos all regularly. One just came to an Arkansas where just somebody being there saying, hey, what are you doing? Causes the police to sort of just go, wait, what are we doing on some level, even though it does not stop the terror. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so yeah, I think actually being present for there, especially if you're white, your white skin will do a lot of the work and then also recording on your phone. And then the other thing is like, if understand what, ab what uh, abolitionists are talking about when they say defund the police, don't just take the Fox News talking points or even the CNN talking points. We did an episode about defund the police. Actually understand what people are talking about so you can engage in those discussions with other people. So I would say those are the things I would say is really, I mean, just the other day, and somebody mentioned this earlier, I was walking down the street in D.C. doing an Instagram Live because I was all excited about my D.C. day. And I saw a black dude being, being, being talked to by the cops. And so I stopped on the Instagram Live and said, this is happening. I'm watching it. Are you okay? And, you know, again, as a black person, I'm putting myself on the line, but I, I feel like I have the privilege as a, as a CNN person to do that. And so I would say, like, really getting involved in your community. Yeah. We also have some resources in the book. Um, so we have a section about policing. Um, and then one of the things we talk about is just kind of um, when to call the police and alternatives to calling the police. Um, so we have... Um, a section where we encourage people, it's kind of the homework on this page. I know folks can't really see it, but um, we basically encourage you to learn about your local resources and options. So if you think you are faced with some kind of crisis in your community, that you have other options to call. So for instance, um, making sure that you know suicide hotline options, um, you know, mental health crisis services in your community. Um, you know, if there are services in your community for unhoused people or, um, you know, all of these things, services for runaway or unhoused youth, right? So instead of always turning to calling the cops, what else exists in your community to call and actually going and making a list of that. And if we have at the end of the book, we have these little cards um, that you can tear out and you can actually write those numbers and have it in your wallet, right? Um, and so then I think a next step beyond that is that if those services don't exist in your community, right, if there are not, viable alternatives um, and community organizations um, supporting folks in the community, maybe that's something for you to plug into and get involved with. Um, you know, we've been seeing in a lot more cities, um, there being, al you know, alternative numbers aside from 911, if there is a, you know, a mental health crisis, something else. Um, sometimes that's coming from community groups, sometimes that's coming from the city, um, but things like that are incredibly critical for reducing the amount of interactions that people have to have with the cops. Yeah, I think that's so important that like Miriam Kaba, who's an abolitionist, talks so much about the importance of, um, oops, sorry, something's coming through on my phone, um, of finding the folks who are doing the work in your community, because odds are, you know, the first question should be who is already doing this in my community, you know, there's the individual actions we take, and then how do we link up with other folks in our community, yeah. because odds are pretty good, I think, especially for those of us who are white, it's important to us for us to hit pause and say, who, who is already driving this work in my community and how do I flank and support that work on the ground? Um, Surge is, is engaged in, in bringing more white folks into campaigns to defund the police and to divest resources from you know violent and racist systems of policing into some of the life affirming and life saving approaches that you named, Kate. So I think if folks are looking for a political home to do this collectively, come on over to Surge. It's a good place for you to, to be in collective action around holding police accountable and building the kind of world that I think we all wanna live in. And I would I say the, the last thing I would say too is also the other way you can, another way to deal with cop, with police violence is actually helping raise the voices and raise the calls for justice when police violence happens to a person of color or a black person in your, in your, in your town, or your neighborhood. Don't leave that up to the black activists. Actually you, cause it, it sort of, I, I said this during 2020, in America, a white person's whisper is louder than a black person's scream. 
it ain't great that that's the way it is, but that's just how it is. So the more you can actually raise those voices, you you will get more attention based on your based on your privilege. Um, and I want to echo your mention of Maryam Kaba, and then someone quoted her in the chat, her quote, uh, hope is a discipline, which I think is such a powerful line. Um, and when it comes to recommending other books for people to read, I have a million books to recommend, but I would really strongly suggest we do this till we free us by Maryam Kaba. Um, um, if people are interested in, in, in thoughts around abolition of you know, police abolition and prison abolition, um, I think she's one of the most powerful thinkers and writers out there who's really impacted my own thoughts. Um, so highly recommend. I, someone can. I'm not very good at typing stuff in the chat while I'm talking, but we do this till we free us by Mary Kaba. Amazing. Um, there's a there's been a couple questions about you all already spoke to this a little bit, maybe, but maybe build on it, like how to have accountability in making it through the book or really, you know, following through and being in that practice. Kamal, you already talked about that a little bit doing it in a partnership. But is there anything else that you all want to say about how to make it through and stay accountable to to doing the work? I mean, I think it goes it really does go back to the importance of doing it with someone and also understanding and not trying to rush through it. I think that's the other thing I would say is like, this may not be something that everybody can do every day. This may not be something that somebody can do. And I think that like understanding that in your own place with it, but really understanding that we have worked hard to create a path through this book for you. <laughs> like, you know, we, we, there's reasons why there's a coloring page that pops up. It doesn't pop up out of nowhere. We understand that sometimes you need to take a breath and also understand that we've also created different ways to engage with the material. My best friend Jason here told me he didn't do the coloring pages because that's not his jam. He's like, look, he's shaking his head no right now. <laughs> but there are multiple ways that we can engage. I bet you did the crossword puzzles. Oh. Yeah, he did all the crossword puzzles. So, yeah, the co you didn't do that James Baldwin coloring page, Jason? Come on, man. Uh, but I think that there's multiple ways to engage with the material in the book. So if you just want to, I would say, what, however feels best to you, we, you can actually, you can just flip through the book and say, ooh, a game that I can play. Great. But we really did design it as a course to start in chapter one and go through chapter five. Love it. Um, all right. Come out, Kate. Thanks for joining me today. This is incredible. I want to encourage everyone to tune in today to buy a copy of the book, do the work, buy a copy, then do the work, buy one for your friend that needs a kick in the ass and needs to get in the work with you, set up a study club to be with them in it. Um, it's been really great to have you all today and want to encourage folks um, to, after you buy the book, also join us. Join us at surge, S-U-R-J dot org slash join. And we'll, we will also uh, put you to work once you've completed your, your reading. Um, we, we need you all in this work. Um, and Rick, Kate and Kamal, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you Thank so much you. for your work. Thank you. See y'all. Thanks everybody for joining in.